uh, Luke, the 18th chapter, and verses 9 through 14 will be the subject matter for tonight. Luke 18, 9 through 14. What do we generally call this section of scripture? How do we look at it? How do we style it? What is it known as? Parable. Uh, what does that term mean, parable? What is a parable? Earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Everybody in agreement with that? Anybody with something new? Something different? I think that pretty much uh, sums it up, a parable. And so what the Lord did, he, he gave many illustrations in his teaching. Sometimes people would say, well, I don't want any type of story, just give me the Bible. I don't want you to illustrate anything, just give me the Bible. Well, that would be unlike Jesus, right? Because Jesus often gave illustrations and he would give short stories to clarify a point. True or false? It's true. And some people don't want you to tell a funny story because they don't like that. But in the Bible, Jesus said... Go tell that old fox Herod. Jesus called him a fox. Wonder why he called him a fox. <laughs> so he was dealing with his character and explaining who he was really dealing with. He was sly, sneaky. And so Christ referred to him in that sense. Let's look at the subject matter. Luke 8, 18, 9 through 14. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Jesus said, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. And how did he say other men were? Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. He said, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me. What? He called himself what? Do we often think of ourselves like that? This man said he was a sinner. Somebody called us a sinner, we might get mad. We might want to do more than that. But he said, I am a sinner. Then he says, Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone that what? I can't hear you. Thank you. Share what? Mm hmm. And? Mm -hmm. So, that's a question for us. What do we do in life? How do we carry ourselves? How do we present ourselves to others? Are we always extolling our character? Or do we allow others? To make points about us. Now the Bible says. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs. It says. Let. Another man. Praise thee. And not thine own lips. Did you hear that? <laughs> wonder, what, wonder what he meant by that. Don't brag, don't brag. Don't brag on yourself. It's better for somebody else to say that you are good if you are a good person rather than for you to say, well, I'm a good person. <laughs> I mean, we all think we're good people. We all think we're good folk. We, we all tend to think that we are all right in the sight of God. This man here did. And so we have a comparison from the Lord. So... When we look at this section of scripture, there are two striking things that we may see. Uh, number 
number one, what is presented to us here is the spirit that is needed when we pray. Now you can have a lot of spirits when you pray. But the Bible gives us the right spirit in order for us to approach the throne of God. And secondly, the spirit that is needed for one to be saved. Which man is characteristic or shows us the latter point when it comes to being saved? Which man, his character is reflective of the point that is made there? Which one you think? Hmm? The second one, the second one I would say. <laughs> the second one. Because the first one seems to be doing what the book of Proverbs says don't do. He extols how good he is. How righteous he has lived. What kind of person he is. Which is which in the sight of God. The Bible says we are not to do that. So in verse number 9. This parable gives us a warning. In verse number 10. We see the scene where two men are praying in the temple. Point number three, we see a man who is animated in his prayer towards God, verses 11 and 12. And then in number 13, we find that the sinner prays. And then in verse number 14, we get the major lesson of this parable. The one that is justified in the sight of God. Now, I would say tonight that there are some people that we think that are unrighteous since we don't know all about anybody's character. Those, that person may appear in the end to be more righteous than we are. Because sometimes we tend to judge and as judges, we do not consider all because it's impossible for us to know everything that a person does in the course of a day. Can you agree with that? I don't know what you do. Do you know what I do? <laughs> so most of the time, we make snapshot judgment about the character of a person. And sometimes it depends on whether we like a person, whether we think they are doing right in the sight of God. Yes, sir. I think one thing also we can see Publican did, I mean, the Pharisee did a lot of good things with the wrong attitude. That's a good point. Because you can do a right thing and have the wrong motive for doing it. He was getting his card punched. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he talked about what he did. I mean, sometimes we should kind of not praise ourselves so much, but we, we would need to. Just do the work for, for, for the Lord in a quiet way and let someone else praise us. Did I say a hand over here? Okay. All right. So, um, Brother, if you don't mind. Yeah. Now, it, it, it's okay to, we, we're talking about praising one for yourself, man. I understand that when a person's speaking up, we know the scripture says, don't let, let someone else do this. That's what he said. But ain't nothing wrong that you have done the right thing. We've read several scriptures where guys have done it in the scripture, and they went to God and said, Lord, I have kept thy will. I have did this. And they were asking for mercy. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't, in the illustration, as this person was here. Well, it is not wrong uh, to do what you're saying. But it may not be the best thing to do that. Because if we're doing well, everybody may not praise us, but some, some people will praise us. The ones who, who are conscientious and the ones who are uh, serious about their praise. I mean, look at all the good that Jesus did. And the people said, he is a wine bibber. They call him a wine bibber. Those was the ones who uh, had problems they said. Right. You know what? Right. But, but you, can do, you can do a lot of good. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to praise you for the good that you do. Oh, no, I understand that. Right. You know, but I'm talking about the self-praise here, which, which this, uh, the public can, 
he showed that he was humble and submissive. And, and, and the other one did not. The Pharisee, the Pharisee was bending himself up. And, and that's, that, that's what the Bible says we shouldn't do. Right. But the statement I was making that there's nothing wrong when you pray to God and you told him, you had said, I have kept your command. I have done what you asked me to do. Mm -hmm. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Well, but when, we, you, we, when you put yourself like this, this Pharisee, right. that's a whole different ballgame. Well, we're saying that to God. It's better to say that to God. The scripture in Proverbs says, let another's lips praise thee and not thine own, which tends to uh, be the boasting spirit that we may exhibit among relatives, friends, and church people, then it's best to let other people have that. Not with this prayer. To uh, make that point. Then now making a prayer in, in the church. In the open, praying in himself. Yeah, praying for themselves. So that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, good. Good point. Uh, yes, sir. Brother Ed. While he's right, I mean, there's a few times that St. Paul is in some of his letters talked about all the things, good things he has done. But you got to look at the motive, you know. If he was saying that, it was to give credibility to himself. If there is any doubt that, you know, he was still on the side of, of Judaism. And, you know, to give credibility, credibility to himself, not to give praise and prestige to himself. But other times in the Bible when someone has said, you know, in a prayer to God, I have kept thy will and done, you know, done my part, whatever, that's to God alone. That's not to... Right. That's not praying out loud for others to hear. That's just between them and, and God. And that's not bragging on yourself. And we shouldn't brag on ourselves in prayer. We shouldn't tell God how good we've been. Paul followed that up, often followed that up with, this is God working through me. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. That does not negate the point that I made about letting right. others praise you. Others should okay. praise us and not we ourselves, else the scripture would not have said that. So we're probably talking a little bit about something that's different. But when you go out praising yourself, that's condemned in Scripture. Period. It's not wrong, on the other hand, to talk to God and ask God to help you to do what you're doing better. But I don't say we'll tell God that, Lord, we've done everything that you asked us to do, because that, that wouldn't be the truth. Right, no, no. Right, I was about to say that that wouldn't be the truth. Right. Okay, then um, uh, when Jesus was talking to the rich young ruler, and he was telling him um, all the things that he needed to do. And he said, well, I've done these things for my youth up. Correct. Then Jesus asked him one more question. <laughs> and he went away. Sorry. That's he right. Now, okay? That's right. Which points out, good people, that the Lord always knows what we are weak. And he knows our weak points as well as our strength. So we should ever be ready to improve ourselves. And not ever think that we have reached the zenith of the Christian endeavor. Yes, sir. I think one thing also that Paul did, Paul told in his letters things that had happened to him and what he had endured for Christ, not bragging on himself, but I think to encourage the faithful people to keep on, you know. He might have bragged the time or two. <laughs> But for the most part, you're correct there. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was saying, I've been beaten, I've been shipwrecked, I've done all these things. Right. For God, for Christ, and you can do it, you know. Push on. Correct. Exactly. I think a lot of that was for encouragement. Too. Great point. These different people he wrote. Great point. Thank you. 1 Corinthians 8 2. Uh, you might want that scripture. 1 Corinthians 10 12. The Bible says, Listen, wherefore let him that thinketh. He standeth, take heed, lest he fall. First Corinthians 10, 12. Galatians 6, 3, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, the Bible says, he deceiveth himself. Galatians 6, 3. And uh, other scriptures, but those will uh, suffice here. Brother Robert? Yes. Even if we do everything perfect, which is impossible, that, and this has been said before, even if you do everything perfect, which you won't, that's still only what you're commanded to do. Exactly. So we have no reason to pat ourselves on the back because it's been commanded of the Master. Now those who trust in themselves, that is those who feel they are completely self-sufficient 
and have no need for anyone else. They feel all they need dwells within their own bodies and minds. There is a feeling that neither God nor anyone else is really needed, not too often, if ever, as they go through life. We got a phrase that signifies the meaning. Anybody know what that phrase is? <coughs> we, we tell people, I what? I got, I got this. <laughs> what do young people say? Well, I got this. <laughs> I got this. See, we need to be careful when we say those things. Well, I got this. I mean, I don't need any help. There's nobody in this whole big old world that can say that they don't need help and, me and really mean it. Because we've had help all of our lives to get us where we are today. The self-righteous differ from the self-sufficient in that they are interested in righteousness and in God. The self-righteous then are those who feel that they are good enough for God as they are. Now you try to convert somebody who believes that they are already good enough to be saved. Man, you got a fight on your hand. And it's one that you might not win. You know, brother, I'm glad you said that. You mm -hmm. can't convert it. Now, the word of God had to do. Well, you, you didn't get up there and teach it. Amen. God do the work, man. You teach the word. You well, can't convert you anymore. Well, that's, that's true. And that's what I meant. I mean, how else would you convert them without the word? Well, some people feel that they... It's so much more important what you just say. <laughs> now, I'm just saying what you say. Some okay. people feel it's about me. That's a fair point, but that, that wasn't what I meant. What I meant when I said uh, if you try to convert them, I, I simply meant that you use the word because that's what we use to convert people, right? We use the word of God. Now, it is true what you're saying is true, and a person should never feel that it's all about him because it's, it's about who? It's about Jesus, right? When you say God, you, you mean Jesus because they, they are one. But it's about Jesus. It's what he has done for us. And if a person is not sharing Christ, then certainly that would be a wrong attitude to have. Look in Proverbs 16 two. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Proverbs 26, most men will proclaim Everyone his own goodness. That's what we've been talking about tonight. But a faithful man who can find. Proverbs 21 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the heart. God is looking at our hearts. God knows why we do what we do. And when we do what we do. So we have to be exceedingly careful. Thirdly, in this section of scripture, in the ninth verse, there are those who despise others. The word despise means to set at naught, means to set at naught. It means to count as nothing, as unimportant and insignificant. Now, when we look at people like that, that is contrary to the will of the Lord. How are you going to convert someone, bring them to Christ, when you think they are worthless, are not acceptable to God in the spirit of conversion. Turn to Acts 10 right quick. Acts 10. In the conversion uh, Cornelius verses 34 and 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth I perceive that God is what? I can't hear you. He is no respecter of who? A person. Now sometimes we do, but God does not. That means we have to grow. God does not respect where you live. You can live in the ghetto. You can live out on North Hill. You can live on private land. You can live in a gated community, but the Bible says God is no respect to our persons. Verse 35 says what? So the person that's accepted to, acceptable in the sight of God is the one that Peter, that Luke describes through the mouth of Peter. But in every nation, he that feareth him, 
respects the word of God and worketh, not just one time, but worketh, that's his life order. That's what he does every day. And worketh what? Righteousness is what? Accepted in the sight of God. And so, there are those who despise some. They shy away from, they ignore, they neglect, they pass by, they downgrade, they criticize, they talk about the poor in the worst way. They talk about the unfortunate. They talk about the poorly dressed. They talk about the homeless, the downcast, those who are lazy, the undernourished, and they talk about sinners. So attitudes of that nature should be uh, watched and we should carefully correct ourselves. In Romans 2 and verse number 4, the Bible says, turn there quickly, the Bible says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance. So that's just um, an encouragement for men to repent of their sins. In Luke 18, 10, these two men are praying in the temple. One is a Pharisee, the other one is a publican. Both men went to the most prominent place to pray. You know there are a lot of people today who don't, they don't want to leave their house. All they want to do is sit and say, well, can I worship God by sitting at home? Do I have to leave my house to worship God? There's private worship, and then there's what? Private worship, and then there's public worship. And public worship has to be done where we meet with the other Christians. And that's why Paul said, don't forsake the assembly. Well, what did he have in mind? Was it Bible class? Was it Sunday morning worship? Was it uh, Sunday night worship? What did Paul have in mind when he told the Christians not to forsake the assembly? See, if a person is not willing to expend some energy to find God, to worship God, you have to leave your house to go to the grocery store to pick up your lamb and your peas and your rice, your collard greens. And you're too lazy to, to, to leave your house to come to worship God? And you say, well, uh, uh, I, I believe I can have God here. You can believe what you want to believe, but your belief will never change the word of God. God's word is true. <laughs> I think y'all agree with me. That's a good thing. Both men went to pray in order to please God. They were both seeking God. They wanted God to accept them. And they wanted God to be present with them in their life. And that's a great thing. You got to seek God. If you want him, you got to seek him. The Bible says, seek ye the Lord while he yet may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return. Unto Jehovah God. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. So if you, if you seek God, one will be able to find God. Then look at the self-righteousness. Uh, the Bible says, the religionist stood and prayed only with himself. You could be in church and pray the wrong kind of prayer. When I say church, I mean uh, with the family of God. And I don't mean this building. Because the church can get out there under the trees and worship God. Am I right? Yeah, you get out there under the tree. We can get out there under the carport. That's the church under the carport. But it's not going to feel too good out there. If the wind is blowing and it's real, real cold, and uh, especially if the sermon is long, because we're going to hear the hurry up the fit, because it's cold out there. You can worship God anywhere. Under the tree, under the carport. We can, if your house is big enough, we can come to your house. Brother James Gunner's house is big enough. Brother Lee Hickman house is big enough. We just get in one of them rooms and worship God. That this building is not the church, right? It's a building the church. Y'all looking funny. <laughs> but the building is not the church. This is a place where the church comes to worship God. We are the church. In Acts 5, verse 14, the Bible says, Titans of these things came into the ears of the church. 
What is that talking about? A building? No. That's talking about the people who had obeyed the teachings of Christ. And so when we pray to God, we got to have the right spirit. We got to have the right attitude and we have to get rid of the self-righteous spirit. In John 9, 31, the Bible says, now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. God will hear those who obey him. Look at Psalm 66 and verse number 18. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. See, if, you, if a person is living in sin, if a person is living uh, a sinful life, he need not call on God. If a sinner has never obeyed Christ, what can he ask Christ for? <laughs> well, he can ask, but he ain't going to get it. <laughs> now, if you mean a sinner in the church, one who has obeyed Christ, he can pray to, he can pray to, he can pray to Christ, right? There are some things that people come to the church house and confess that they should be confessing. Private sins need to be confessed in a private manner to God. Public sins need to be confessed publicly. And we should not get those confused. Sometimes husband and wife have a fight or falling out. Don't nobody know about that. You come and say, well, my wife and I had a fight last night. Well, why are you telling us that? <laughs> That's a private matter. That's between you. I don't know what you're pointing to me <laughs> That's between you and your wife. A private matter deserves a private confession. And a public matter. Now, if the brothers, uh, two brothers get out here at the church building, and, and uh, one tell the other way, you come on around this building, I'm going to show you something. <laughs> and the other one is foolish enough to go around the building. <laughs> and then we, we have to walk around there and see y'all all tied up and, 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 and swinging on each other, then that, that wouldn't be right. And so the scripture is very plain there. Uh, two men praying in the temple and asking God, and God heard one, and it seemed like he did not hear the other. He heard one because one was expressive of humility. You, when you pray to God, you don't, you don't tell God off. You don't tell God what to do. You humble yourself before the Lord. Verses 11 and 12. The, the Bible says this man stood and, and prayed with himself and said certain things and, and, and praised himself. We have to be careful about praising ourselves. You don't have to remind God of, of what he told you he was going to do for you. Just pray and be thankful to God for what he is doing in your life. And sometimes we be quoting scripture to the Lord. The Lord gave the scripture. He knows that. He knows the scripture. <laughs> Stop quoting scripture to the Lord and pray like God told us to pray. This man thanked God for making him what he was. He thanked God that he had been kept from the sins which people counted as public sins or, or scandalous sins. And there are some people like that. They think because they don't drink, commit adultery, or do one or two other things that they got it made to heaven. But they have a nasty attitude. The Bible says do not be bitter against your wife. If you're bitter against your wife, that's a sin. The Bible says do not provoke your children to wrath. If one provokes his children to wrath, that's a sin. We have all kind of hidden sins inside of us that we need to confess to God and ask God to give us help. This guy forgot pride. <laughs> yeah. It's prideful to do that. Now sometimes we think certain things are all, all right, but they're not. So we have to consider that, listen to what he said, I fast twice a week. Imagine going without food two days every week just to seek to worship and please God. Now that's really positive. How many of y'all go one day without food a week? I can't hear you tonight. Some of y'all say, oh, not me. I'll perish in one day. 
<laughs> we, are, we are Americans. We believe in eating. Yeah, we believe in eating good. A man told me one time, he said, you need to go back to Africa. I said, ain't no way I'm going back to Africa. I've never been to Africa. I'm an American. <laughs> I love it here, don't y'all? And then he said he tied not only 10% of his income, but 10% of all that he possessed. He gave a tenth of that. And then look at verse number 13. Someone read 13 right quick. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, mm -hmm. but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. The sinner stood afar off. He was ashamed and embarrassed by his sin. Let me tell you something. When you commit sin against God, you should take it personal. David said when he committed adultery and murder in Psalms 51, he said against thee and thee only have I what? Have I sinned? When we transgress, it's a sin against God and the word of God. And God does not feel good when we think, when sometimes we call, we say, well, it's just a little, I just told a little white lie. Well, it's a lie. God did, he doesn't describe the lies, whether they are long lies or short lies, black, white, polka dotted, or neutral. A lie is what? A lie. That's a lie. All the righteousness is All of it. That's right, Brother Wiley. You're exactly right. Every bit of it. So he, he listed his, his tithing. Now, it's a good thing when people tithe, right? Man, so I tithe. I pay my tithe. Some of us in the church have a hard time when it comes to the money. We say one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, but don't preach to us about money. Well, you want to see some mad folk in the church of Christ? You preach on money. <laughs> you might not get no handshakes that Sunday. <laughs> what are you doing up there talking about that? Well, that's his job to talk about money. He has to warn you that if you're stingy with your money, you can't go to heaven. Because God is a giving God. He gives to us every day. Let God cut off his out right now. All the sleepers will wake up if they, if they can't get no out. They're going to wake up. What's the matter? I can't, I can't breathe. See, if you think you're so big and bad, then you just do without God's help. He called himself the sinner. This is very critical. He did not feel he was just a sinner like everyone else. The, the humble man called himself a sinner. How many times do we go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I have sinned. We'll tell on somebody else, but we will tell on ourselves. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I need you. That's how you get God. You humble yourself. Because God sent his son to do what? For our sins. Hmm? To die for our sins. Exactly. And then in verse uh, Titus 3, 5, Titus 3, 4, and 7, Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, Micah 7, 18, if you want some scriptures on that, 12 and 13. Then the fourth verse, very quickly, we're justified by the salvation of God. The major lesson of all of these verses is justification. The words of Jesus are shocking, contrary to what the world teaches, contrary to the opinions of men, and even contrary to the way many believers act. The scandalous sinner is the one justified in the sight of God. Listen, there are people that we think will not go to heaven. Those people may end up in heaven and we may not. We better be careful. Sometimes at, at, in funerals, you know, we judge people that they are lost. How do we know? We don't know that those people are lost. We, we human judges. We're not the arbiters. We're not the final arbiters of the acts of men. Because we don't know enough. But the Bible says the eyes of the Lord, Proverbs 15, 1 and 2, the eyes of the Lord are in every place doing what? Beholding. That's right, watching. Beholding the good and the evil. Mark 2, 17, they that are whole have no need of the physician. But they that are sick, 
And the Bible says, I came not to call the righteous, but who? But who? Sinners. To repentance. We act like we're afraid of sinners. We said we don't want them coming in our church building, but those are the people who need to be saved. The drug addicts. The drug sellers. The prostitutes. The liars. They all need God. Romans 4, 25, 24 and 25, and uh, Romans 5, 1. And the Bible says in Luke 14, 11, For whosoever exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. In Proverbs 29, 23, and I'm done, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Proverbs 29 and verse number 23. Thank you so much. God bless you. We appreciate you for coming out tonight. We trust the lesson has been a benefit to your soul. In the book of Romans, as we close out tonight, in the book of Romans chapter 12 and verse number 19, the Bible says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heat coals of fire on his head. The Bible says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. If you're present tonight and not a member of the Lord's church, the scripture is simply saying, God sees all, and God knows all, and God will be your avenger. So we must do what is right, and we must walk according to his will and way, and continue to practice love in his church. If you are not a Christian, the extension of the gospel plan is for your life tonight. Jesus said in Mark 16, he that believeth and is baptized, shall be saved. If you are a Christian and have walked contrary to the will of the Lord, then the Bible teaches us that we should repent of our sins and confess that we might be restored to his body, the church. If you need him tonight. When we walk with the Lord in the light.